before we start, um, I wanted to show you something really cool. Um, this is uh, something I found. This is uh, called Piedra de Peñol. It's in Medellin, Colombia. Um, it's a huge monolith, uh, 200 meter tall, and 66 million tons. Um, I've been up to the top of this uh, monolith. And to get to the top of that monolith, you have to try, um, climb 659 steps, right? There is no lift. There is no other way to get there. The only way to get there is you have to climb 659 steps. And you might be wondering, why so much effort? Well, when you get to the top, you encounter this amazing view of a dam that is so, so beautiful. And so the 659 steps are worth it. Uh, but it doesn't seem like it when you're climbing. And um, you might be wondering, why are you talking about this? Uh, this is a microphone thing conference. Why are you talking about monoliths? Well, the first thing is, I wanted to show you that monoliths can be cool. I mean, this is a really, really cool monolith. And the second thing is, it's really painful to climb up this monolith. And, and that's probably the reason why uh, we are here, because a lot of people have started with a monolith and it became a really, really difficult thing to achieve something. So that's where um, microphone tents uh, came about. So the title of this um, presentation is uh, Microphone Tents, the Evolution of Frontend Architecture. And what you can expect from this talk is uh, we're going to embark into a journey through the evolution of frontend architecture. We will be answering questions like, you know, what's the difference between monoliths, monorepos, market frontends, uh, do I need micro front ends? I mean, a lot of people might be joining today will be asking, uh, what is this micro front end thing about? Do I need micro front ends? What are the risks of micro front ends and distributed systems? And uh, maybe advice on if you already are overwhelmed with all of the choices and really cool technologies they have seen for so far, where you can start your micro front end journey and distributed architecture journey. Okay, so we, we have a a problem with, with software. Uh, the software has a really, really big issue, which it has this tendency to grow. Uh, even small applications can start you know, growing and growing. And, and the problem with applications that start growing is there is a point where stuff starts to break, right? Uh, things start getting too complex and things start to break. Things that used to work before when we had just a small application, don't work anymore. And that is a really annoying treat of software. But the question is, what do we do about it? Um, we are engineers. We like solving problems. So when you see something broken, we want to go and fix it. So engineers, we like that challenge. And, and we want to go and fix this uh, issue with, with things are starting to break because of the scale. Now, that's why a lot of companies uh, have started this uh, journey. They they saw, okay, the monolith is not enough. We go into, let's implement a micro front end or distributed architecture to fix this problem. That's a good idea. You want to go and fix that problem. However, this happens. So we don't do it because it was easy. It's because we thought actually solving that problem I thought I think it would be it will be easy. Let's implement micro front ends and then let's solve the problem. However, I want just to say distributed systems are hard. And let me say it again, distributed systems are really, really hard. It is not easy. So if you are thinking about thinking about in, implementing a new uh, micro front end architecture, uh, unfortunately, is is hard. It's very hard. But uh, we 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 should be able to fix the problem. Uh, the other thing is. Even, even when you start trying to fix the problem halfway through the implementation, and I have seen this a lot, is we start wondering, hold on, why did we want to implement micro front ends in the first place? Uh, what problem are we, are we solving? And people realize that the problem sometimes still there, right? Like we implemented micro front ends and the problem still there. So there is now a big difference. So we implement the micro front ends, the problem's still there. Now this is the difference. Now your problems are distributed across multiple layers. And this is what we want to avoid. We don't want to get there. We want to be able to solve the problem and make sure that you can uh, uh, 
solve it without causing even more problems. And the problem also is that we want to implement micro front ends first. We don't check all the options available. Like we focus on the actual solution, which is the micro front end architecture, but we don't explore the, the option. So today, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about what are the options uh, to micro front end. Uh, and before we do that, I think you're familiar with this, but I want to show, um, define the problem first, see what problem we're trying to solve and see if we can apply micro front ends to solve that problem. So what's the problem? Do you have a problem? Uh, if you don't have a problem, then I think uh, micro front ends probably be uh, a lot of complexity. Uh, if you don't have a problem, then definitely you don't need micro front ends. The, the reason people are jumping on uh, implementing micro front ends is because they have a problem. Right, they have a an issue with the application that is not scaling, and an issue with an issue with the organization of scaling. So first, if you have a problem, we need to find also the what's the right incentive to solve that problem. The right the right incentive when you start from the problem is that you know that you're implementing a new architecture for one reason, not because someone came uh, in the organization and saw micro front ends in one of these conferences or presentations and they thought, oh, actually, micro front ends are cool, let's implement them. I think that's probably the wrong incentive. The wrong incentive is to uh, focus on the tool. The right incentive will be focusing on solving the problem. So what would be the best outcome? Well, the best outcome is to solve the problem and making sure that we don't make an even bigger problem. So what are the problems that people are facing uh, where they start thinking about micro front ends? People start seeing something like uh, uh, symptoms that I I like to call one by one, but the, the one of the main symptoms is uh, application instability. When things start to break, uh, applications become fragile. Um, I don't know if you have seen uh, this film, The Butterfly Effect, or if you know what the butterfly effect means, but it's basically if you make a really, really tiny change in a completely unrelated part of the system, uh, there will be huge consequences and there will be repercussions across the entire application. So application becomes applications become really fragile and, and they start experiencing this butterfly effect when you just cannot make changes without causing more problems. Uh, and this causes in turn lack of confidence when shipping new features because you know that whatever you touch is going to break the application so you are really hesitant to uh, make changes and, and deploy new features. Uh, and that's also because of lack of failure as isolation the whole application goes down if there is a small change introduced that causes a problem. So this is one of the, the, the main system symptoms, which is application stability. There are more symptoms that we can have a look. Um, the, the next one is uh, exponential growth. Exponential growth is actually a good thing to have. I mean, if your companies are not growing, then you're in trouble. Your company is in trouble. So growth is, is important. Uh, increasing the number of developers, the company, the business growing is, is really good for, for the business. The problem is when this growth uh, is exponential, when you have a lot of new developers coming, uh, the, the, the application and the features are increased and you start developing and, and creating new features, um, that also start, starts causing a lot of issues. Um, you know, the CI CD pipelines uh, start becoming really slow, deployments start taking hours, uh, and it's difficult not just managing the infrastructure, but also managing the people, managing the organization, it becomes difficult. So the technology and the organization becomes a, a challenge. Next symptom of a problem is uh, lack of uh, team ownership. People do not know what they are meant to be maintaining or owning in a large application. Developers, I don't know if, if you have ever joined a company and then you arrive on your first day, you don't know where to start because the, the code base is so huge and the context that you require is required for you to make changes is so huge that it will take you weeks and even months before you can land your first uh, PR to production. Uh, so it's a really, really long and steep learning curve uh, because it's an overwhelming code base. Right, so we have some symptoms. We believe we have a problem. Now, there are many ways of solving this problem. Uh, if we focus just on micro front ends, we are uh, just escaping a lot of other ways that we could solve this problem. And, and the problem is that we go uh, from zero to 60 um, and we want to go from a monolith to a micro front end distributed architecture 
uh, without exploring the alternatives. So, so this is the problem. We go, you know, monolith. We have a problem all the way to distributed architecture, and we don't examine. Okay, can we solve this problem a different way? And will micro frontend solve my problem? But can we explore other alternatives before we go into micro frontend? So it's very important to explore the alternatives and not go straight into the answer of let's implement a distributed architecture because that might be um, difficult. So I came up with um, with this diagram to explore the alternatives and to show what uh, the evolution of the different part architectural patterns have evolved and arriving to micro front end. And this uh, is what I call the distributed and decoupled spectrum. So how to decouple an application that starts to, from a monolith all the way from micro front ends. So here is the diagram, uh, what I call you know the decouple and distributed spectrum. Uh, we we start from you know where everybody starts with a monolith. We go progressively to up, applying different techniques, and finally we arrive into micro front ends uh, to solve the problem. Let's examine each of these one by one, and let's see which one of these are the probably and a good option for you to implement uh, in at your companies. So the first one is, this is uh, no surprise, of course, the monolith. And you might be, oh, why are you talking about monolith? This is a micro front end <laughs> conference. Monoliths are fine. Most, most applications start a monolith, as a monolith, right? If you don't have a uh, an architecture, you're probably are using a monolithic architecture, which is uh, simple. Uh, most applications start uh, as a monolith. Uh, the definition will be is a single deployment unit. Uh, the problem is monoliths have this bad reputation. And if I say monoliths in a microfunding conference, we'll be like, oh, boo, it's legacy, it's not trendy. But actually, monoliths are fine. Monoliths could also scale to millions of users. And there are issues, but in some cases, monoliths could, could be fine. Um, there are different types of monoliths, and we were going to be exploring those. Uh, the first time, uh, the first type that we're going to be exploring is the full stack monolith. Then we're going to explore what the front end monolith is, which is apply, applies to micro front end uh, in this topic. And a new monolith, which is uh, is an interesting uh, thing that is happening, which is the meta framework. So let's start with the, the full stack monolith. This is the old school monolith. Uh, this is what uh, a lot of people, if you've been in development for more than you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 years, you will be like, this is this is what we used to. Uh, code and and is still relevant today, which is a full stack monolith, where the back end and the front end are together. All the code is in the same place. You connect to a single database or data store, and it's a single unit of deployment. Uh, so before the the advent of microservices, before we started to uh, split my front end, uh, sorry the front end into different single page applications, this this was the de facto architecture. You have a monolith, and it's a full stack monolith. Uh, but then you, we know we all know what happened next. Uh, before we go into that, what, what are the pros and cons of the full stack monolith? Uh, well, the pros and cons. The pros uh, is easy at the beginning, and this is a clarification. At the beginning, when the application is small, it could be faster and easy to use a monolith uh, because everything is in one place. It's just one or two people working on it. So in the early stages of the project, this is amazing. You can just have the database, everything together. Uh, it's easy to find things and modify things. And there is a, no, a lot of mental overhead. It's one application, here's everything. I need to make a change, I deploy to production. The cons um, of a full stack monolith, well, the later stages of the project, when we have more developers, the application starts to grow, there will be problems with uh, scaling in terms of technology, uh, but also it starts becoming really difficult when there are multiple developers involved. So scalability, coupling, lack of flexibility, starts becoming like a, like a big thing that you cannot move. And it becomes even harder to reason about because things, things start to, uh, there are too many things in one place now that you cannot figure out where they belong and what they do. So there are a lot of problems with um, the, the full stack monolith. So now what, what happens? What's the next uh, stage of, of, of the evolution? Well, uh, let me just uh, give you an, an example uh, of full stack monolith before we go there. So the be before we move into the single pitch applications and everything, let's, let's have a mental model of what a full stack monolith looks like. 
And I think there is an example that I found recently of someone who is still on a full stack monolith running on a single box, same database, which is quite surprising. I probably know which one it is, which is Stack Overflow. They are still on on-prem, their own data servers. I think last time I checked, I mean, I don't know if it has changed, but they're still on a monolithic architecture. And they don't, they, they, they say it works, it scales, there's a lot of people who are using it. And they haven't even looked into moving to microservices. So not even thinking micro content because they're still in a monolithic architecture with not even microservices, which is fascinating what I found. Um, but another examples of full, full stack monolith that we can find are you know, Ruby on Rails, that's a most common example of a, a full stack monolith, Django, PHP, anything that uh, has come with their own database and backend and front end together. As I mentioned, Stack Overflow. And GitHub is, is an interesting one because GitHub is, uh, used to be uh, one of the examples of a full stack monolith, but they have been trying to move away from that. I'm not sure what the state is with GitHub these days, but they, they, they've been slowly adopting uh, other alternatives. No, so uh, microservices happened. And if, you, if you're aware of what happened uh, during this transition, uh, the backend team said, fine, we found this new technology, which is called microservices. They're going to start um, separating things out. And we have, the, here, are the, here is the front end, and you front end developers do your own thing. We're going to split into microservices. And this uh, also coincides with the race of APIs, like communicating through APIs. Uh, so we have le been left with what we call the front end monolith. The back end is now separate. We communicate through the back end on APIs. And it's been out. It's been out of the monolith, um, and this is where the rise of uh, single page applications and API communication come. So the front end monolith, uh, the pros of the front end monolith, we have um, well, the back end can be independent, so we don't have too many things in one place. Uh, you can use modern JavaScript frameworks now because you can just communicate through APIs to the back end, so you don't have this. Uh, a restriction on that you have, must use this backend framework uh, or this front-end framework uh, is more flexible. And you can have the benefits, uh, arguably, of single page applications or modern applications, which is you know user experience of a single page application, so developer experience using more uh, fancy tooling. Now, um, the cons of the front-end monolith. So what are the cons? Uh, well, it's still a monolith, right? It's still big. It's just the front end, but uh, we, we have still some of the same issues that we have with the full stack monolith inside there. It depends on the size of the application and number of developers again, but the more developers you have in a front end monolith, the more difficult it becomes to make changes. Examples of front end monolith, I think I mentioned, you know, more, modern libraries like React, Vue, Angular, communicate through APIs, and you have a single repository hosting these applications. Uh, most companies who have embraced microservices rely on front-end monoliths, you know, to uh, adopt and to implement their view layer uh, of, of the application. Now, um, there has been something really interesting that has been happening lately. Uh, and I, I know you're aware, it's like an emerging trend I have seen. And there is a lot of uh, people talking and saying, you know, is the monolith back? Are we going back to uh, having one thing in one place? And this is because of the rise of the new monolith, what I call the new front-end monolith, or AKA the meta frameworks, where we, we have all these uh, new fancy uh, frameworks that are usually based on JavaScript that have evolved from single page applications and are going back to implement it, you know, things like uh, the routing, server-side rendering, um, all of these nice uh, authentication features. And you can also now connect to the database again. And these things uh, with, the, with the meta framework is that we are going to back to putting some of the front, the back end, sorry, into the, the front end monolith. So it's like we're going back, but there is also more uh, flexibility and modularity. Uh, you don't, you're not that restricted. Meta frameworks are really flexible and allow you to evolve into, if you want to use a separate microservice, you can. If you want to use a database inside the, the micro, uh, so the monolith, you can. Uh, and all of this is improving to some extent the modularity of the system and try to solve a lot of those problems. And it has new tooling. We are using new uh, 
you know, faster tooling and JavaScript frameworks who are really good for developer experience. Those are the cons, the pros, sorry. The pros for these meta frameworks are, you know, modern tooling of single page applications, set of uh, robust out of the box features. Uh, you can choose your backend. Uh, that's probably one of the pros of the meta frameworks. Like you don't have to uh, go with just database. You can also communicate to APIs or so third party APIs are supported. The cons, well, it is still a monolith and you have to deal with the problems and challenges of having a lot of people contributing to the same monolith. So all of these disadvantages from a, for a, from a full stack monolith are still present in the, meta, the new meta frameworks. Um, the difference is improved modularity and definitely improved developer experience. But the problem is not the technology, the problem is uh, scale. And monoliths are fine, and they, but they start cracking when you add more people and when you need to scale the application. Um, so that's why monoliths start to, to, to become an issue. So what do we do about this? Shall we go straight to micro front ends? We know the full stack monolith or or these monoliths are not working very well. Let's explore two more options before we talk about micro front ends. And these two options might not be familiar. They are a bit difficult to explain, but let me just uh, try to do my best to um, put this into different buckets. So the, this, the next one is the modular monolith. So before uh, companies started embracing micro front ends, they realized they had some problems with, with modularity, with uh, scaling and too many people they started implementing what is called the modular monolith. And the modular monolith, as it says in the name, is trying to separate parts of the code into uh, uh, different places to, to become modular and try to uh, abstract it, uh, apply a little bit of domain-driven design and make sure that things are in the right place in the monolith. However, most modular monoliths are a single deployment unit still, and there is a lot of complex uh tooling to make that happen like stitching all them together and deploying them as one uh, but the idea of this was to avoid a complexity uh, especially uh going to full microservices uh, a lot of companies were like we don't want are nobody to go full microservices let's implement a modular monolith which could be a monolith a full stack monolith like front end and back end together or it could still be uh, a front end monolith as well that could be modular so those options are there the monolith pros, um, well, is technically more scalable. It solves a bunch of problems that you can have with a full stack monolith. It is less complex than a fully distributed architecture, like going full microservices or full micro front ends. It's got better code organization, some resemblance of boundaries, uh, and you could potentially solve a lot of those problems by implementing a more modular code. The cons, well, it's a single deployment unit. So if you want speed and uh, you want to deploy things quicker, you will need to deploy the entire application most of the time anyway. Uh, and also modules are not fully independent. They are still depending on, on, on the main monolith or, or how to uh, compose them together is still really hard because they are not modular. And also there is still a large code base. So modular monoliths still have one single repository that has things uh, all over the place. And it's difficult to, again, navigate that core base. So that's the modern monolith examples. Um, I think the most famous example is the Shopify uh, modular monolith, uh, which they wrote an article, you go and find it. And it's, it's a really interesting article on why they decided to go uh, this way and not implement microservices and why they wanted to implement just a, a modular uh, uh, Ruby on Rails monolith rather than going all microservices. It's a, it's a really interesting one. Uh, check it out. Let me know if there have been any updates and changes. Uh, everything changes so fast. But last time I checked, they they uh, ex ex they explain how they achieve uh, faster the, the development deployment uh, using a mon modular monolith. So what's next? Um, after a modular monolith, there is something really cool that I have noticed lately, um, but it's really hard to describe, um, which is uh, what I called integrated applications. Integrated applications are like in the middle between a monolith or a mod modular monolith uh, and a fully distributed architecture at micro front ends. And these are really blurry. Some people might argue that what I'm calling integrated applications could be still a modular monolith. 
or what I'm calling integrated applications could also be defined as micro front ends. It's very hard, but uh, I will try my best to, to explain more of the examples on why I believe integrated applications are a little bit different from, from a micro front ends and a modular monolith. So the first thing is uh, when you think about an integrated application, a lot of people associate them with monorepos. However, monorepos are not a, a tool or architecture that uh, they're not an architecture that is influencing the outcome. It's more like a tool on how to organize your code. But the principle is is uh, how you organize that code, and monorepos are really, really useful for that. So you can start making modular uh, sections of the applications um, that are a little bit more independent than uh, modular monolith. They could potentially be so independent that there is a very small uh, change that you have to make to make it fully independently deployable and going all full-blown micro front end. A lot of people could be um, using these integrated applications on uh, different URLs and subdomains and composing there is a very simple way of splitting applications. And a lot of companies have, have done that. Uh, they don't probably not call it integrated applications, but it's more or less the bucket I want to try to put this so it's easier to understand. So integrated applications, um, the, the pros of, of using an integrated applications is that you are one step closer to full independence and modularity. You're starting to decouple things. Uh, you can potentially deploy them as a single unit or you can deploy them uh, step by step. And you can have some more complexity, but it's still manageable. It's not a fully distributed system. And in the case of the front end, you, you can still have some uh, manageable uh, tooling and just need to have a really uh, small integration. The cons of integrated applications, um, I mentioned in most cases, they are still a single unit of deployment, although that can be different. You could deploy slices of application independently, but not granular. Um, it's independent deployability is limited. You could encounter issues with fragmented UI and bad user experience because the applications are independent, but they are not cohesive. Um, and if I look at the examples, what I mean by that is I have seen um, two different examples of what I classify as an integrated application, uh, which is multiple monolithic instances that are composed at build time, uh, or they are not composed of, uh, at all. They are just completely separate URLs. Uh, and I think that there was an article from um, Vercel that they were explaining, you know, how to deploy um, an application that lives in the monorepo and has multiple uh, applications into one. Uh, which is a tool called Next.js Zones, I guess, which puts the applications into separate uh, domain URLs, like subdomains. Like for example, you could have your documentation site and your application site, and they are on a separate domain URL. They could potentially share some code. But the, the problem with this is uh, they are too independent and there is no cohesion. You could end up with uh, issues with um, uh, communication, a bad user experience because you'll be a full page refresh when you go one to the other uh, and there will be also some maintenance. So this is what I call integrated applications. Some people might be like, is it not don't micro front ends? Depends, as I'd like to say. Um, finally, uh, I think uh, we are reaching nearly the end and uh, what we came here to, to talk about, which is micro front ends. Micro front ends are the distributed, fully distributed architecture. and the benefits are uh, independent, completely independent applications, multiple units of deployment, team, team autonomy. And all of these things, if you can achieve these things before arriving to micro front ends, then you can stop and assess if independent deployability is something that you, you definitely need and want, then definitely micro front ends is the way to go. Uh, there are two types of micro front ends, build time and runtime. And build time composition micro front ends, uh, I have seen this uh, quite a lot and the main um way that people achieve build time composition is you package them you deploy them but then you don't um, you will have a shell that compose them at build time so you still have to do some sort of build uh, step to get them together uh, but then you can have some independence and and, and unit versioning examples uh, mpa packages you'll be surprised how, how many people a lot of people use npm packages to do microfunding composition uh, 
that's uh, a header and a footer, for example, that is shared as an NPM packages. We also know that this, uh, those cause problems <laughs> um, because you have to rebuild the entire application when you deploy a new package. Uh, there is a company called bit.dev. Uh, I think they introduced runtime recently, but they usually they were uh, focused on build time micro front ends where you can just uh, have really, really cool tooling to uh, help you with the, the build step. And then runtime composition micro front ends. This is probably when I talk about micro front ends, this is what I talk about. I talk about runtime composition, uh, which is uh, every single build is separate. Uh, we have fully independent deployments. New versions are enabled at runtime for the user, so no build needed. All of that magic this is where I call the, the runtime composition micro front end. Examples uh, in the single page application, um, simple example, we, we always we have seen multiple version singles file. For server side rendering, is, there are more complex examples, but you can also, also achieve runtime composition. Code organization, uh, you can also have multiple repositories for micro uh, which I have tried that. You can, multiple repositories can work. Uh, it's independent. There are a lot of uh, things that you can do to keep the independence. Single repos responsibility sim uh, principle, uh, multiple repository micro are great. However, <laughs> they also have cons. Really hard to track. You end up with a folder with 50 or 60 micro front ends, and you have to go and find the right one to make a change. Uh, and it's a bit tricky to do governance as well. So multiple repositories are great. Lately, I have been opting for micro front ends with monorepos, uh, which have really, um, it's a really cool concept. It also has its challenges, but we can have independence, but have everything in one place. That is easier to track and manage and have boundaries and ESLIN rules that are shared across. Uh, it's easier to governance and enforce governance. But it's a bit tricky. It's very complex. Tools there are helping us to uh, make it less complex, but it is still really hard. I'm still uh, struggling to get the perfect setup with a modern repo and micro uh, I want the best of both worlds, and I think it's really challenging to achieve that. But uh, also another uh, thing that could happen with a mono repo is that you could potentially, if you are not careful, introduce accident, accidental coupling. Right, so here we are. We have arrived at our distributed architecture. It is um, the distributed and decoupled spectrum. So the more to the, the depends on where you want to go and the more to microphone tens, uh, the more decoupled the system will be. And the more to the right, we go, the more independently deployable your application is going to be. But also, the the more to the right you go, the more people, the more teams, the more uh, uh, the, the organization grows, also the more the complexity you will end up with. And that is uh, also an issue that you need to take into consideration. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is, um, Explore all the benefits and different options that you have on this diagram. And if you have a problem, focus on the problem, try to solve it, and, and you can choose. And what I've been trying lately is that you can move from one to the other. Like you can go and implement a, an integrated application to get your, mono, your uh, monolith ready and then make that jump to micro front end. If micro front ends are causing issues, you could potentially go out, take a step back and then deploy everything at once as well. Uh, it's something that I'm exploring, uh, which is really cool. OK, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm, I'm running out of time now. I would like to answer some uh, questions. Uh, but yeah, my name is Ruben Casas. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Ruben, for the amazing talk. Um, I always think it's so important um, to think about the intent of a solution, right, or paradigm or technology, because oftentimes we as developers, we're always amazed about the new trends and technologies and want to use it without even evaluating what is the best solution for the problem that we're trying to solve, right? In the end, there is no silver bullet in software development. There are only options. and um, Every option comes with their own benefits and pitfalls. And the hardest thing in reality is making the choice and living with the consequences of the trade-off that the decision brings to our application. And uh, the answer to the questions, what is better, uh, what is better, is uh, like you said, Ruben, always it depends, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and architecture, and especially with this case, everything is a trade-off, like Luca likes to say. 
Uh, so you need to choose the right, uh, as you said, the, what the consequences, living the way the consequences and making sure they are aware of the trade-offs. Uh, not perfect, <laughs> but uh, you can get very close to a solution that solves your problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, I've never seen a perfect system in my life. I hope I will someday. <laughs> um, never seen it But <laughs> uh, uh, until then, we're going to um, dive into the questions. Okay. So, okay. Uh, do you want me to read it or? No, I want to read it for you. So the first question from Vladimir is, uh, would you agree with the statement that you should never start building your app as micro front ends, but rather go through an evolution from monolith to micro front end architecture at a later stage? Um, this one gets asked, you know, and it's the same with microservices. Like, would you start with micro front ends or microservices at the startup? Um, I believe, most cases, the answer is do not implement micro front ends of microservices at the beginning because uh, at the beginning it's usually you know a small team. You don't have a lot of problems. You need to focus on very very complex problems that are not to do with the architecture. You will have to focus on building mm -hmm. the products and deploy fast and remaining competitive. So introducing that complexity uh, might distract you from the the goal, which is to make your company grow. Uh, what you can do is you can design an application in such a way that it will be easier to do that transition, to make that jump to a micro front ends or microservices, uh, which is defining your domain boundaries, defining you know clean code, and ensuring mm -hmm. that you're not writing spaghetti code everywhere, because at that point, everything becomes um, really tricky. So that's where the, uh, the new um, trend of having these meta frameworks providing modularity is really, really important. It's really cool because it's very easy to switch. You know, like if you're a single page application using a meta framework connects through the database, but there is a little clear contract between what the UI and what the backend is meant to do, then you can move it to a serverless function, you can move it to a microservices, and that should technically still work. And the same with the UI, if you are using component, libra uh, component libraries or component models like the one provided by React or, or, or these, comp these other frameworks that help you do modular, modular code that will be easier just to port into a more distributed uh, frame architecture will be easier in the future. There are exceptions. Um, I think I have two exceptions if I recall. So one exception would be if, um, uh, when, when you could do this is if <laughs> If the company is too is growing too quickly, I have seen a case. I don't know how it went, but a company who grew like in six months went really really quick, and they implemented micro front ends very early. Uh, but that's rarely the case. Like having something that grows very 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 quickly is very rare. It's always more like a gradual incremental um, approach. Yeah, so uh, maybe uh, let's say um, building a monolith and never thinking about how to split um, the services and the domains into microservices would be complicated, right? So maybe start with a monolith, but already keep in mind that you want to split um, the whole thing. Modularity, yeah. Yeah. Correct. The next question comes from David Das. Um, does the compon uh, componentization make it easier to do the gradual transition from monolith to modulith and micro front ends? Yeah, actually, I think the modulith is a is, some, is a is a term that I didn't put in there. Uh, to me, the modulith is either a modular monolith or an integrated application. I have them mm -hmm. as separate because they are like there are things that are very different in a modulith and a, a modular monolith. There, are, these terms are for us to try to put you know wrap our heads around, but they are not like strict. This is a modulith. Yeah. This is a micro front end. Uh, it's very difficult to describe, but yes, this is what I was saying earlier. You know, making your components and you know front end, especially uh, libraries that help you make components and separate your UI logic in reusable modular pieces is always a, a good start, and it will help you do a gradual transition. So, for example, if we if we compare migrating a um, monolith that uses uh, jQuery, for example, uh, that it doesn't have a lot of modularity is harder than having a set of React components that are already, or components that already like have some sort of boundaries and some sort of usability and some sort of structure. Uh, so putting a effort into make components 
it usually helps a lot with this transition. Also, uh, micro frontends without a component library that um, the micro frontends can use the components will end up in a very messy application, I guess. Everything will look super different. Exactly. Yeah, component libraries are amazing for uh, helping you with uh, standards and also cohesive UIs. Awesome. Then jump to the next question. Runtime composition equals web components? Question mark. Uh, web components are a um, an implementation of, of, of runtime composition. Runtime composition means you don't have to build the application to push an update to the user. So if you think about this, whenever you deploy a, um, a new version of the application so users can see it, you will be running a CI-CD pipeline that builds this, uh, publish it, and then people can see it. With runtime composition, you don't have to build it at once, you can build it at any time, and then you can enable it uh, like an update over the air for users. So whenever they see or they refresh the page, now they will see a new part of the, the UI appearing on the screen. Um, it's easier to understand when, once you, you have more modular and independent deployable applications. So the problem with applications that cannot be deployed independently is you have to build it and deploy it. Where independent deployments and runtime composition means that you can just build them, store them in a CDN or whatever, and you don't need to uh, deploy them in the sense of you don't have to build and deploy. You can just separate the build process from the deployment and the deployment occurs uh, at runtime. So the browser will get different JavaScript uh, tags from the different components that can be achieved with web components that can achieve to, with uh, module federation and that can, there are many ways. If you think about this, an iframe is getting this from a URL mm -hmm. and you yeah. just change the URL and you didn't have to redeploy the application. Kind, kind of the same runtime composition. Um, so not just web components, there are many ways that you can achieve uh, runtime composition. Awesome. Okay. The next question is, is the multi-repo independence worth it? You tackled this already, making things maybe complexer uh, than it needs to be. I have tried both. And to be honest, at this point, I don't know which one is better because both a multi-repo and a monorepo have their challenges. I think uh, what I'm uh, trying to achieve is a hybrid between a multi-repo and a monorepo. Uh, which will allow you to have monorepo for certain things. And if you want to split little parts of the application that are, don't make sense to have in a monorepo, then they can be independent uh, repositories. The problem with multi-repo is we, you, have, you end up with a lot of uh, Git folders, really mm -hmm. difficult to track where they are, but they have a guarantee, which is independence, which is very, very important with micro front ends and, and distributed systems is that you don't, need, you don't want coupling. Uh, having them as separate repositories will give you some sort of guarantee that any boundaries that are crossed or any libraries or any dependencies that you have are very explicit. You know where they're coming from, you know uh, what are the, the inputs and outputs of that particular part of the system. But the maintenance overhead is uh, significant as you grow and you have more and more of them. So I'll probably, it depends on your company, I'll probably try them. Monorepos are great. The problem is they are very complex to set up as well. Uh, and to have the right approach and balance between a monorepo and independent deployment is something I still try to find the sweet spot on, on monorepos and independent deployment. But yeah, it's worth it. I think it is if you can deal with the complexity, with the amount of repositories everywhere. Exactly. Um, always the more distributed the system is, the more flexibility you get and more uh, encapsulation, but also you have to um, keep track of more moving pieces. <laughs> okay, so our next question is, uh, for the build time composition, would you push thing deeper and have applications composed by multiple libraries that are also module federated? Um, I'm not sure module federated in what context here. Like if you are talking about module federation, uh, that's just a way of um, delivering the code at runtime, right? 
Build time composition is more, we have uh, a lot of applications that have been uh, built and potentially deployed. Uh, an example of this is NPM. Like you build your NPM package and you publish it to NPM and you have a published and um, built artifact. But when you want to use it, you have to NPM install it and then deploy your application with that new change. For runtime composition, you can skip the second part, which is my application, I don't have to NPM install it, test it and deploy it. You can just get the, the version directly from where it's deployed. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure multiple libraries using module federation uh, it's, it's probably it's a bit tricky. I'm not sure what the question will be, mm -hmm. uh, but that's much more or less the difference between build time and runtime. And module federation is usually a runtime uh, tool to get code uh, a runtime from the browser. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question. So, what is our recommended approach for implementing micro frontends with server side rendering? Right, server side rendering. I used to work in a framework that was micro frontends and server side rendering. Um, if we're talking about server side rendering from the single page application mode, because I have to clarify, when we say single server side rendering these days, we assume a single page application that's server rendered, but actually server side rendering is just traditional applications that you hit a URL and then you give you mm -hmm. some HTML. So <laughs> if you're talking about the single page application with SSR, it is possible. I have uh, done that. So basically, you get you can have a server that will do the composition of all your microphone tens, uh, and then render that on the server and then send it to the user. At that point, you will en enter the single page application mode, where you could potentially just get uh, new parts of the application, as you do with a CDN uh, or a normal single page application fashion. It's a bit more complex. Uh, implemented microphone tens with SSR. But again, it depends on what framework you're using. If you're using a meta framework, that's another completely different story. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like for example, how to implement this with Next.js, it will be very different to how to implement it uh, with any, you know, like Angular or any other application that can do service side rendering. So it's, it's a tricky, tricky one, but it's possible. Uh, it's just the composition happens at, on the server level. So you can server render this. And also, you don't need to do uh, server rendering with a single page application. I think Luca has this archi reference architecture of serverless uh, using AWS, where you can do server side render micro front ends that they they have like a layout engine and you compose them on the server and then you server render them. Uh, it's just uh, different depending on what framework you're using. And definitely different if you are already using a framework because you cannot move like you have to deal with the constraints of using that framework. Okay, thank you so much for your explanation. Um, okay, so maybe we have time for more, one more question. How can we secure our each micro front end? So, uh, secure the same way that you secure every other app. The micro front ends, the security. Now, one thing I have to say is managing the um, authentication. Uh, it could be challenging if you. But if you follow like uh, best practices with the the platform, the web platform, you know, like using cookies that are shared securely across the whole user session and all micro frontends have access to it, like a HTTP only secure cookie, it becomes really easy. When you try to do like token passing, that becomes a bit more challenging. So I would recommend looking at what the best practices would be for, for your particular use case. Uh, but yeah, I don't think security in terms of I'm not sure, security authentication or security, uh, not, not sure what is security, but if it's authentication, definitely HTTP only cookies are the way for, for front end if you, if you want, it will be easier. Otherwise it becomes a bit tricky, tricky to share tokens and etc. on micro front end. Oh, okay. Uh, how should libraries uh, be distributed among micro front ends? Uh, NPM, <laughs> the same way you distribute them. I mean, this one is a tricky one because usually libraries are built on composition. Like you, again, your NPM install something. You could potentially federate them as well. So you don't have to uh, build them, you can get them. But then at that point, what is a micro front end and what is a library becomes a really 
tricky boundary to define. Mm -hmm. um, the the same way libraries in my uh, experience, my experience from my experience, I would say just npm library. Uh, you package and distribute that library to your micro front end, and then the micro front end themselves that include those libraries will be um, independently deployable uh, units. So. Um, that's what I would say for libraries. There is a problem with versioning and deduplication, which is probably one of the hardest problems in micro front end. Uh, but there are many ways that you can do that. The shell can provide set of libraries. Uh, Module Federation has a deduplication feature for, for dependencies, for example. Um, but yeah, just the same way you distribute and deploy libraries for any other application, I would say. Okay, as the architecture have types change, in, uh, yeah, I'm getting here all the questions um, from uh, my uh, streamer assistant. So as long as the questions keep coming, we keep going. As the architecture okay. types change in terms of complexity, what is your opinion about testing and test integration complexity related to the four arcs? Okay, so certain things become easier to test. Uh, like when you are independent, uh, it becomes easier to test uh, like at the unit and integration level because you can just test parts of the application. But the end-to-end, -end, uh, it's not that it becomes more difficult. It is you, you will have to make sure that you compose the application and you can perform end-to-end. -end. I don't think it is harder uh, in terms of complexity. I mean, it's a bit di more difficult, but it's not like it's a, it's a breaking uh, I think that's going to break your decision. You will still have to test. You will still have to uh, compose and do end-to-end -end testing. So if the users can compose the application and see it, you should be able to do end-to-end -end testing. And tools like uh, you know the, the test runner that we have these for end-to-end, -end, like Playwright or Cypress, they don't care if there are 500 micro front ends. They just care to the, the page is rendered and you can assert and make changes to it. So if you think about it, it's going to make it easier to test the components individually, like the different module boundaries individually, because you can just integrate or unit test those in isolation. And then the composition and integration together, well, you, you will still have to do that anyway. So it doesn't really matter if it's a bunch of micro front ends. Uh, as long as your users can see it, then you should be able to do end-to-end -end testing. Uh, 